So our keynote speaker today is Suzanne Kogut. She is the executive director of the Charlottesville Albemarle, Virginia SPCA. It is an open admission shelter. She is part of the 90% club and she'll explain more about that to you and what she did with her shelter to get there. She is an attorney by education. She was a successfully practicing attorney for a number of years. And then she went on a cross-country journey to basically find her passion, find her soul. And luckily, her passion was our passion, which is saving the homeless pets. She then landed this position at the Charlottesville SPCA without any background in animal welfare. So she came in with basically a clean slate and, and put into practice all of those items that made it a part of the 90% Club. So with that, I will introduce Suzanne and let her tell you her story. Thank you, Cheryl, and you pronounced Albemarle correctly. That was beautiful. It took me at least about, I don't know, six months before I could do that, so I congratulate you. Um, so I know we think we're here to talk about animals, but I'm going to start with a picture of the New York Marathon. If anyone's been there, this is the Baranzano Bridge, and that's the New York Marathon. I start there because I have always wanted to run a marathon, and I haven't. Has anyone run a marathon? Raise your hand. I, I actually am very envious of you all. Congratulations. I think that's an incredible feat. Um, when I was in law school, I ran with some friends about two to six miles. And when I, after, you know, at work, we would run, and I've always wanted to run a marathon. At this point in my life, I probably think, for me, running a marathon is impossible. Um, why? I probably work 10 to 12 hours a day. I have six dogs of my own. Um, I'm exhausted by the time I get home from work every day. I'm a lot older. I haven't run in years. I'm in the worst shape. So those are all my excuses. And I have one other big excuse, too. I have asthma. And the asthma, as I've gotten older, has gotten worse. So for me, running a marathon feels impossible. I've got a million excuses. Can't do it because. And here's all the reasons. The truth is, there's only one reason I'm not running a marathon. Because I don't want it enough. I don't have the passion, and I don't have the desire to do it. Because tomorrow, if Richard Avanzino from Maddie's Fund, or Wayne Paselli from the HSUS said, hey, we're going to take $5 million from the money that we have and give it to your organization to save animals if you run a marathon, Guess what I would be doing? I would be running a marathon. And, and I, would, I would absolutely, I know it in my heart, I would do it. It may take me a long time, but I'm going to do it. So, I mean, to me, I start with this because I think all of this about saving animals and what we can't do and what we can do, I think it all boils down to our attitude going into it. So... Our organization started off like this. Maybe this is what your facility looks like. Small little shelter, pretty dismal. Some of you guys recognize it. We now have this. Um, 32,000 square foot building. We have a veterinarian clinic in there. And, but you know, they moved in. The organization moved into this facility in 2004. And despite having a new building, this did not solve the issue. Because when they moved into it, they still moved into it with a small building attitude. Okay, so there's a lot more space, but there wasn't just a lot more space, that's it. When we moved into the new building, they're taking about 5,000 animals a year. And, and let me take a step back. Our organization, um, serves the city of Charlottesville and the county of Albemarle. 
that we also contract with the city and the county to be their pen. There is no other facility, we are the pen. All the strays come in, if the animal control has a corning case that comes into us, like quarantines come into us, everything comes into us, we are the only facility in our community. We have a community of about 142,000 people. It's, you know, it's a fairly small community, but that just means we actually have less adopters. Um, and, you know, they moved into this new building still killing more cats and kittens than saving, still euthanizing 53% of them. So big building didn't solve all the problems. Had some foster homes, not a ton of foster homes. 50% of the animals adopted from the organization were not spayed and neutered. They were adopted with a contract that someone would spay and neuter them afterwards. Um, really, you know, limited hours, poor customer service, not a lot of marketing. It was the, let's just see if anyone comes to adopt them, and if not, then we'll euthanize them. You know, you, and, and really, when people did come in to adopt them, people weren't even, the, the, the staff that was there was not even friendly to people. I mean, I walked in to interview, no one said hello. I couldn't even find anyone. I didn't know where to go. Gorgeous building, but no one even took the time to say, hey, glad you're here, welcome to the SPCA. Um, and, and, okay, so some of you may know this too, uh, volunteers and staff, they really didn't get along. They really disliked each other, poor public perception, and we had a lot of financial issues. Because despite the new building, it wasn't paid for. They didn't have to raise, raise all the money. We had $3.5 million of debt, which we paid $200,000 a year on, and had no history of raising that money. Also didn't have a history of raising money to actually have the staff to operate it. But in 2000, early 2005, what we did was they hired new leadership, that would be me, and we adopted a new mission, and it was a no-kill mission, and it was to get to a no-kill goal. And I, you know, when, when I started, actually, the board wasn't sure. They had heard such horrible things about no-kill. It means we're going to hoard animals, and we're going to have overcrowded, and you just, well, if you want to sort of do that, do it, but don't tell anyone. And I'm like, okay, really? The, the, the biggest fundraising tool we have is to say, we want to save all the animals, and you want me to do it, raise the money, but don't tell anyone. It can't happen. So I sort of snuck it in as we went along. But pretty much the board was saying it too. But really, I mean, I think this is a lot of times this is really the changes. You really have to come in and not just have, you know, a new building and everything else, but it's really about a new attitude. That's what all this is about. You have, you know, for us, it needs a relentless determination to save lives. Solutions, not excuses. That is my favorite thing to say constantly. When I walked into our organization, the only thing anyone could tell me was, was why we couldn't do something and what the reasons were. We can't because. It will not work because. No one actually wanted to do anything. Um, focus on the positive. Don't always focus on the negative and, and what won't work. We actually, I just said, stop telling me what won't work. I won't hear it. You know, just give someone give me something. It was actually to create a sense of empowerment for the staff that, I think it was Michael Hyatt who talked about the difference between leaders and victims is that leaders are active, victims are passive. Stop being a victim of your circumstances. You have to take that action and everyone can influence the outcome if you do something. Um, you know, there's another, there's another quote that I like by Warren Bennis. It's a new leader has to be able to charge, to change an organization that is dreamless, soulless, visionless, and someone's got to make a wake-up call. And that's what our organization needed. It was a wake-up call to do something different. And then if you're going to do something different, my recommendation is to set audacious goals. Don't say if we're euthanizing 50% of the animals, Next year we're, only, we're gonna, or if we're saving 50%, next year we're gonna save 55%. Go for 75%, go for 80%, but set big goals, don't set small goals. So we had a new attitude, or we were trying to have a new attitude, 
How did we go about it? Did we do a five-year strategic plan and plan it all out and take a year and a half to do that and then see how things went? Our strategy was a little bit different, and it's what I call the just do it strategy. <laughs> Remember Nike, just do it. There are a lot of things that you can try, and you don't need to have a five-year plan that figures everything out, because let me tell you, you'll never figure it all out. You won't figure it out until you're doing it, and you're going along and fixing it along the way. So what's it? It is, there's a lot of programs that have been proven to work. And we call it, some people call it the no-till equation. These are just the ingredients to success. So these are the programs that have been proven to be successful. You have to have accessible hours that you're open to the public. And this doesn't mean 5 o'clock until 6 o'clock. Um, yeah, we're actually open till 6 o'clock. You want to know when our, one of our busiest adoption hours is? Well, it's 5 to 6, but it's also 6 to 7. Because if they're in the building, we are not closing and saying, sorry, you can't adopt. If you're in the middle of adoption, you finish it. And so we staff later because people will always stay. Um, but it's 5 to 6 is definitely our biggest adoption hours, and obviously Saturday and Sunday. Um, it always amazes me that people will be closed to the public for adoptions, but open to taking strikes. Now, how ridiculous is that? Um, you know, improved customer service, foster care, optimal animal care. The one thing I'll say on this is do not underestimate the importance of cleaning. And I think there was a presentation on this. We have a bit of a motto that we say. What's the difference between a clean cage and a dirty cage? Anyone? Go ahead, yell it out. Yeah, we say a dead animal. I mean, we'll put it blunt. But if you clean something correctly and then disinfect it, you are saving an animal's life. So, you know, don't, don't underestimate the importance. And spay neuter is number five on the list. And I'm not saying spay neuter is not important. Oh, okay, yeah, not number five. Who, who, who's counting my bullets? Um, <laughs> spay neuter is at the bottom. Um, it's not that it's not important. I think you absolutely have to do it. I don't think it's that you should wait and for five or seven years or whatever the, 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 they say the normal time is before your intake goes down. I think you've got to do a lot of things in the meantime. And all these other things are much less expensive. And we're going to talk about that at the end that's favorite, and you can save lives. But really what I discovered before we got going is one of the most important things ever is getting the right people on your bus. Um, because when I first started, we had new ideas, things we wanted to do, and I had a lot of people on our bus that wanted to sabotage anything from working, and they wanted to prove it couldn't be done. They were for this, and, and I think this is a bit sad, that people wanted to be right, and that was more important than doing right and saving animals. They wanted to prove it couldn't be done, so they didn't want to be helpful. Those people need to be off the bus. It, it, has anyone read Good to Great, Jim Collins? Jim Collins wrote a book, Good to Great, and it was for the for-profit sector, and he looked at the differences between good companies and great companies. Just a, a while ago, he just wrote a monologue that was for the social sector, looking at nonprofits and saying, what are the differences between good nonprofits and great nonprofits? And one of the things is he focused on getting the right people on your bus. And he said the difference with nonprofits and for profits is the right people on your bus are not necessarily the ones that want to work for the most money. And I actually think we should be compensating people fairly. I'm not saying we shouldn't. But the right people are those who are productively neurotic, <laughs> self motivated, self -dis disciplined, who wake up every day compulsively driven to be the best they can simply because it's part of their DNA. The more of those people you get on the bus, the better off you're going to be, and you're going to be able to accomplish a heck of a lot more. 
So, and, and you know, for me, I have story after story about this, but I'll share one. We, we were, first time our organization, we had this new building, no one knew it was there. So we had this huge adoption event, we invited all the rescues in the area, other SPCAs that were surrounding us, and this was unheard of, but we had done it. For us, it was like 57 adoptions in one day. We were thrilled. And there were a couple people in the back. They were sitting on a chair, sort of leaning back. And I walked up, and I was like, woo, we did 57 adoptions. Isn't this great? Isn't this fantastic? And what was their response? Well, you know how many animals we took in today? Uh, now, if we were going to take them, we're, we're, the, we're, the power, we're taking them in anyways. It's going to happen day after day. But if you can't get excited about adopting them out, and you can't celebrate that, and you can't want to do more of that, it's time to actually find another job. Um, and that's actually what they have to do. Um, foster care, there's all the reasons for foster care, but foster care, I'm going to say, so long as in this country, we are euthanizing animals for space. Space is your number one reason for foster care, and it's for everyone. It's not just the organization that that's the pound that has to take in the animals, but it's the rescue groups too. So if you have a rescue group and you have 10 foster homes and that's all you can do, you should set your audacious goals to get 30 next year. Everyone needs to be a part of getting more foster homes. This illustrates why foster homes are important. The white bar, and you see in the middle, April, May, June, July. Can everyone see that okay? The white bar is the cats and kittens that are coming in on a monthly basis in our organization. The gray bar, or whatever, the darker colored bar, is what is getting adopted, transferred out, and actually, have to say, we don't have a lot of cat rescue groups that just take mounds of cats from our organization. Um, and it's also what's getting um, redeemed by owners. And as we all know, and I, I think you probably do, the redemption rate for cats is not very high. Um, and it's, it's primarily because most of the cats have never been out. We're getting the kittens from the, the cats that are living on the streets. So that's the difference. And despite having a 32,000 square foot building, we did not have the space for all that difference on a monthly basis. The numbers of cats and kittens coming in, we'll, we'll take it about over 400 a month, every uh, month in the summer. And when we, um, no, I, I, so I talked and said, so we have to get more foster homes. We have to get more foster homes. And what was the answer? We can't because. We have as many as we can possibly do. We can't possibly get more. They were actually putting 300 animals in, in 2004. They had put 300 animals in foster care. They actually was pretty good. It's not like they weren't doing anything. But everyone said we, we couldn't do more. We also had a policy. This was one of my favorites. That any kitten, and it was actually a well-reasoned policy. We had limited foster homes. So the best thing to do would be to use them for the least amount of time, to put as many kittens as we could in to get the most adopted. So any kitten under five weeks of age would be euthanized. It's a written policy. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding. This is the Ezekiel Kitts policy. That's all anyone's going to see about this policy. I can't fundraise for an organization that kills kittens as a written policy. Why don't we get more foster homes? Well, we can't because. And then if we get, I said, well, let's try. And our policy will be, if we have no other alternative, then we will use them the kids. Well, even if we get in foster homes, we won't be able to adopt them out. We've already adopted out everything we can. And I said, well, if we can, we will, we're hired. That's one of the main things we should be doing. And if we can't, someone should fire us. So we're going to try to get more kids into foster homes. And we went down a path of doing a lot of different marketing. This was just a little postcard that we put around all, all around town. It can be as simple as emailing everyone and their brother that you know, telling them to email everyone and their brother that you know. Always put a picture of a cute kitten there that needs foster. And don't worry, if that was already fostered, they'll take another cute kitten. They're not particular. And this is the interest in our foster homes. 
So we went from the 300 when we couldn't possibly get any more animals into foster homes to the next year, 992. And then we went to eight, 17 to 1800 every year after that. About 38% of our intake is going to go into foster home at some point in its stay with us. This, we could not achieve what we've done without the number of foster homes that we get. And then these, these individuals, I mean, it becomes so easy the more you get. We would get people coming into our door and going, you know, my daughter Jennifer went to her friend Mary's house and they had these cute little kittens. Can we have some too? Sure, come on, let's get you some cute little kittens. We have them. Yes, there's education and all that, and this is a sort of a presentation on its own, but you can do this. 